Hi everyone, uh, my name is Grant Hoddle. I'm your professor for Painting One and welcome to our first class live stream. Um, this is really weird for me. Uh, it's a new experience to be trying to teach in this kind of format and so um, I hope you'll just bear with me. I decided to do this in lieu of edited videos that can be very difficult to kind of figure out as you work and um, in order to uh, you know, just kind of maintain a little bit of a sense of what it would be like to actually be in the classroom with you guys while you work and where you can ask questions to me. So um, as we go through the live stream today, if you have any questions, type them into the YouTube chat. You have to make a, a, a username for that if you haven't done so yet. Um, I know many of you are probably on YouTube all the time. Um, just type into the chat. I'll try and every now and again, take a look at the chat board and answer those questions in the video. If you're watching the video after, like, you know, later, no big deal. Skip around as you need to. Um, I will try and post some, um, like, time signatures for individual things that are happening in um, the video at the same time, okay? So uh, the point of today's live stream is to give you an idea of your materials that I'm asking you to buy, to talk through a little bit of the stuff that I would go over in any kind of day one studio scenario, and, um, to work from that and kind of help you understand what it is that I'm asking you to buy. And if you haven't made the decision as to whether or not to go with oil paint or acrylic paint, I hope that I'll be able to give you enough information um, to figure that out for yourself. So, um, okay, let's get started. Um, so what you're looking at here uh, in the smaller screen up at the top left is my general painting setup that I'm gonna use. Uh, for today, I have an easel and a small, this is actually a 16 by 20 canvas. It's the same size, actually the exact same. It's like a cheapy Utrecht canvas uh, from Blick that I um, uh, have provided for you in your uh, canvas kit that you can pick up at Clark. If you haven't done so yet, you should schedule that with Ian Beckett. Um, you can just email him. Uh, that link is many places on canvas, don't forget. If you get the 16 by 20 pack, you'll get five of these, which is almost enough for the whole term. Um, but it's pretty good. If you get the smaller pack, you'll get seven canvases of 11 by 14. Nice to have the extra canvases. Kind of sucks that um, you'll that they're smaller. So uh, also behind me, you can see the still life that I'll be talking about a little bit later. But first, uh, the reason your screen is so big and set up for my whole palette surface here is because I want to talk through a little bit about um, the materials that I want you to be thinking about and using um, for yourself. Now, first of all, the surface itself is my surface is a plexiglass surface. It's hard um, and it's a really great surface for cleaning and for working on top of. It's backed by white paper underneath. That's the white surface that you're seeing. And then it's duct taped to a piece of um, masonite, uh, which is like, you know, just hardwood. Uh, and that's a really cool way to make yourself a big at home um, palette. You can see how big this one is. It's about as big as a table. Um, if you don't have a place to have one of these that's a little bit more permanent and um, you want to have um, just use like a regular um, disposable paper palette, that's completely fine. Uh, normally in class, we would mostly have disposable paper palettes and that's good. Um, I have some brushes laid out here and I want to just really quickly also some palette knives. I want to talk about some basic materials that you'll be using throughout the course of the term. Then I'll talk a little bit about paint, a little bit about safety, and we'll go from there, okay? Um, I'll be using oil paint for today's demo, um, and I also have some brushes set out. Now these are um, brushes, this one's a really cheapy one, these are all Utrecht. Uh, Utrecht brand uh, was bought by Blick. Blick is the uh, art supply store that's in downtown Portland. Uh, it's one that I highly recommend, it's a really good store. Uh, also Artisan Craftsman Supply on North Lombard is a good one and close to Vancouver. Um, so this is what's called a round. It looks like uh, a round brush. It looks just like every paintbrush you've ever seen, uh, like the one that like Mickey Mouse used in uh, Fantasia. And this is uh, great for making lines that can taper. So if you press harder, it gets thicker. And as you pull up, it gets thinner. These are the same. They're just much, much smaller. These are also rounds here and really good for fine detail work and organic shapes and lines. The other two that I have out are flats. Flats come in a huge variety of sizes, of course. You can even have some that are this big uh, and bigger. Um, and they're great for filling big areas, for doing a blend, and also for creating straight lines. And I'll kind of show you a lot of those tricks 
uh, as we go along today. Okay, so that's that's these are some of your main brushes. Other ones that you might see uh, that I'd recommend you get if you like them are filberts. Filberts are a little bit like a cross between a round and a flat. Um, I love a liner brush. Here's a liner brush that I have. It's just an exceptionally long round. It's hard to see in this tiny little thing, but uh, just a long round and it, it holds a lot of fluid inside itself and um, is easy to keep making like a single line across a long surface. Um, some people like fan brushes, you know, the kind of classic like uh, Bob Ross, you know, happy little tree uh, things. I personally find them kind of useless, but um, you know, if you like them, that's great. Let me talk briefly about, uh, these are our palette knives. I recommend you get one of these at least um, and that you get one in metal. They sell them in plastic for a little bit cheaper, but the metal ones last obviously a lot, lot longer and they're way easier to clean. You can clean them just with a razor blade. You just kind of scrape the side of them with the blade and it's a, a really easy way to kind of uh, to clean them. It's the same way I clean this glass palette, by the way, is with a razor blade. Um, okay, let's talk paints. So here's a little brief primer on paint. Uh, paint is made up of two things. It's made up of uh, pigment and binder. Pigment is uh, usually of dried powder, can be mined um, from the earth, or it can be created in a lab in terms of like a chemical process. And um, that dry pigment is then um, floated inside a liquid medium called a binder. In the case of oil paints, which is what I'm gonna be using today, um, that binder is called a uh, it is uh, a seed oil. It's like linseed or walnut oil are really typical uh, binders for that. Um, it's kind of a myth that oil paint is flammable. It's about as flammable as olive oil. So that is a flashpoint um, that's very, very high, like 500 degrees or something like that, uh, which means it will burn, but it, it's it's not going to just immediately burst into flames or something like that. It's, it's a seed oil that comes from plants. Um, in the case of acrylic paint, your binder is a um, uh, acrylic polymer, uh, basically a plastic that is in liquid form. This would be true for latexes, like if you paint uh, latex uh, on, on the inside of your house or anything like that, um, that's what the binder is there. So the main difference between picking between acrylic and oil happens to be the binder and whether or not you wanna do that. Now, of course, acrylics, they're, the, ad, the advantage there is that they are uh, water soluble. So if you um, decide to go with acrylic, you clean up your brushes and everything with water, you use water to thin the paint, um, etc. It's relatively safe, it's relatively clean, you can fix it really pretty easy. Uh, the downside is they dry super fast, like within 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and they dry to a plastic finish. Uh, some people really love it, and I, I love tons of artists who use acrylic paint. Um, but it's a it's it's decidedly less kind of luscious and delicious than um, oil paint, which has like a little bit shinier uh, finish, and it just it dries a little bit more lustrous, um, and a much much slower drying time. Now, when it comes to the drying time of oil paints, it mainly depends on the specific brand that you're using, the specific seed oil that they're using in that, whether or not it has any resin mixed into it, and the pigment load itself. So titanium white, for instance, here's a uh, standard titanium white from Gamblin, a brand I like a great deal. They're out of uh, Oregon. And um, this is uh, titanium dioxide, the pigment inside that, and again, an oil-based uh, uh, seed oil, so in this case, linseed. And um, it's a great paint, but it's very, very slow drying. Like if you put like a big thick skin uh, of uh, titanium white, it might take multiple days to dry. Um, so sometimes I use this stuff, which is the same uh, surface. And uh, by the way, I know it's really hard to see this in the viewer. I will write these names down in the comments in the description uh, below. So if you have any questions about them, you know, just throw them at me in the chat. This is a uh, by Graham is the name of the company, and this is a fast dry formula. And it just has an alkyd resin mixed into the paint and it makes the white dry a little faster. Still mixes with your oils. Uh, by the way, that reminds me, oil and acrylic don't mix. You can't use some acrylic and some oil in the same palette, okay? Um, the reason for that is because oil and water don't mix and the binder that's inside them will cause the one or the other to clump if you mix them together. Uh, now, that being said, oil can always paint on top of acrylic. 
So if you have an old acrylic painting and you're moving into oils for the first time, you can paint right on top of that. The other way is not always true. Many acrylics won't stick to a heavily oiled surface. So um, just bear that in mind. Uh, oil can go on top of acrylic. Acrylic can't go on top of oil. Um, to, for today's uh, project and your first homework assignment, the black and white still life, you're going to just be using two paints, titanium white and ivory black or Mars black or lamp black. I'm fine with any of those. They're all um, a little different in temperature and in pigment, but they're all pretty similar for our purposes. The reason I'm having you start in black and white and not color is because this is painting one and I wanna make sure you get some practice at using your brushes, at using your materials, um, at mixing when you're not dealing with the complexity that color can bring. So um, I'm gonna squeeze out a little bit of paint here. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of your safety rules when it comes to paint. The first thing that you need to know about are that certain pigments are themselves toxic. This is true in acrylic and oil, okay? Because the pigment remains the same. Because of that, I'm gonna put on gloves. Um, I use nitrile gloves. Um, these are uh, non-latex, uh, but they feel like latex. And they're just a little tough they, uh, they don't break very easily or anything like that, and I like that about them. The reason I wear gloves, by the way, is because of uh, I don't want my skin to accidentally absorb any um, pigment that's in the paint, and I also don't want any solvent uh, to get on directly on my skin. This solvent right here, solvent jar, I'll open it up. Um, I asked you guys to get uh, something called the silicoil jar, which is a really nice, uh, cheaper version of this. This is a little bit more expensive when it's good for um, traveling because the lid can cap on. But so this is solvent. The only solvent you should buy if you go for oil-based paints and you're painting at home needs to be an artist-grade solvent. Now, what I'm using is something called Gamsol, um, and it's, again, by Gamblin, and this is the highest-grade solvent on the market. Um, it's an odorless mineral spirit, and that's what you have to use. You cannot use, let me repeat that, you cannot use paint thinner or hardware store turpentine. Uh, both of those are way too um, caustic and way too off-gassing, and they will essentially smoke you out wherever you are. They're, um, you can really only use them outdoors, okay? So you have to get artist-grade odorless mineral spirits. Gamsol is the best, it's also the most expensive. Um, you can step down if you like towards something um, uh, like a Mona Lisa is very good, Terpenoid is very good, and those will be okay for you to use inside, but you still wanna have adequate ventilation, open a window, have a fan on, and anytime you're painting in oils with solvents, you need to pay attention to whether or not you have a headache. If you can feel yourself like kind of getting a little ache, you usually feel, feel it behind your eyes first, go get some air. It should, it should uh, 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 cap out really quickly. Uh, and one other thing that can help you while you're working is to occasionally just put your lid back on top of your jar when you're not actively using it. That way it's not consistently off-gassing into your room while you're working. Um, so solvent uh, is toxic, okay? You need to have um, gloves because if, if you touch it with your fingers consistently, what will happen is it can basically irritate your skin. Uh, this is kind of gross, but I'll tell you a quick story of mine. For years in grad school, I didn't use gloves. And uh, I went to U of O for grad school, by the way, go Ducks. And um, I had uh, consistently, just would always have this patch of peeling skin on my index finger on my left hand. And I, had, I could never figure out why. And then I was one day cleaning uh, my brush and I'm using a rag and cleaning it like this. And I realized that each time I'm doing that, I'm just like pouring solvent over my finger and that solvent was just like eating away at the skin and causing the top layer of skin to peel. And so it's pretty gnarly, you know, you wanna wear gloves while you do it. And it will also help to protect a little bit from um, other pigment exposures. Uh, so Zoe says, uh, I'm glad the smoke went away before this class. Oh man, me too. Uh, let me tell you, Zoe, um, it is, I'm so glad that that is the case. This has been like the worst time to be trying to be you know, really a Washingtonian and Oregonian, like we're just trapped inside. Um, yeah, it's just a, a nexus of, dest of destruction out there. So 
Me too. Thank goodness. Um, okay, let me see. Where was I? Oh, yeah, pigments. There's a few pigments that I asked you to buy um, that are potentially um, dangerous, uh, particularly if you consume them. Okay, and I'm going to talk about the main one right now, and it's cadmium. This is cadmium yellow, cadmium yellow light. It's a very expensive paint. It's very beautiful. It's really high pigment grade, really high key chroma. That means very intense color, which is why artists use it. It's wonderful. But the problem is, is that cadmium, and it usually comes in yellow and red and orange are the most common ones, but you can also find a cadmium green, um, is cancer causing. Okay, it's a heavy metal, kind of like um, mercury or lead. It can build up in your system over a lot of years and can be very dangerous. Now, the good news is, is that in its binder form, not very dangerous, okay? Don't eat it. Looks delicious, isn't delicious, don't eat it, okay? Um, it's mostly dangerous in its dry powder pigment form, where if you were to inhale it into your lungs, it could be very dangerous, okay? So cadmium is something to keep an eye on. I put on your um, uh, syllabus um, material sheet an option for something a little cheaper, um, and a little less toxic than cadmium for when it comes to yellow, and that's Hansa yellow light, uh, again in Gamblin here, or naphthol red is the substitute for cadmium red. So those are good options if you wanna stay away from cadmiums. In blue, a very expensive and dangerous pigment is cobalt. Cobalt is similarly tough. So right now, cobalt, cadmium. The only other one that you usually have to worry about is something called uh, flake white, which is made with lead. And just like any other lead-based pigments, as you all know, um, they can be bad, especially if consumed. Uh, they can cause um, all kinds of problems. So when it comes to oil versus acrylic, you might ask yourself, what's your best situation? If you have a toddler at home, you might wanna go acrylic so that you can dump your water all the time, okay? Uh, if, you, if you live in a space where you're, um, can control it. Uh, I really kind of recommend oil. If we were in the classroom at Clark and we weren't stuck in our COVID dungeons, um, I would encourage you all to use oil in the space. I think learning in oil is a great way to go. Um, the things you learn in oil will translate to acrylic. The things you learn in acrylic don't always translate back into oil. And that's kind of my two cents on it. Um, I also just think oil is just richer, it's just prettier. So that's the one that I recommend. But really, pick the one that's best for you and the best for your home setup. You can make it work either way. Whichever paint you choose to go with, oil or acrylic, do not dispose of your paints down the sink, okay? You want those to be, um, you wanna be careful about that. You wanna uh, clean them off under rags and throw them away in the trash uh, after they dry. And then it's a lot more safe that way. Okay, um, I'll talk a little bit more about paint disposal later if you guys have some questions about that. But I'm kind of anxious to get started a little bit, okay? Um, so I'm gonna take my um, flat brush here and um, I also have my microphone like sitting on my palette so that might be really loud. Let me know in the chat if it is, okay? Um, so I'm just gonna dip a little bit into the solvent. I have uh, ivory black and uh, titanium white, both from Gamblin brand sitting out. I have a fair amount of both. And uh, one of the reasons I really like Gamblin, grab a rag here. It's always important to have a rag with you while you're working. Um, that way you can control a little bit of the moisture that's on your brush. When it comes to rags, I don't think anything fancy, uh, you know, an old cut up t-shirt is perfect, okay? This is just literally like a, a dish, towel, dish towel that I decided to convert into um, a painting rag. Um, one of the reasons I like Gamblin paints is because straight out of the tube, they are pretty pliable. Now, some paints aren't, that's not really the case. They are a lot more um, like thick and you have to kind of cut them with oil in order to even really make them usable. But Gamblin straight out of the tube, pretty good. And so what I'm gonna do is just kind of start mixing uh, my two, my white and my black and, and just kind of play around with it a little bit and talk to you about some of the consistency that I'm looking for here. Um, I know that um, my webcam is like, okay, right? Those of you who are used to watching, you know, live streamers and stuff are, are probably going, yeah, this is his second one ever. Yeah, bear with me, I'm sorry about that. I'll try and get better at it as I go, but um, I'm hoping that you'll at least be able to get the gist. So what I'm doing right now is I'm using a single brush and I'm mixing a little bit of white into my black in fairly equal steps. So I have pure black, about a medium gray, and then I've stepped it a little bit closer to white. 
And I wanna step that out a few more times. And each time that I'm grabbing a little bit of white, I'm just kind of moving to the side of where the previous one was. The reason for that is so that I can see where I came from with the previous paint tone. Uh, when I need to get a little bit more fluid into my, into my paint, I'll just dip it in the solvent a little bit and then work it into the paint. You can see I'm also getting some of the color out of the back of the brush and pushing it back up into the paint system. Now, this is where you have a decision to make. Um, and that is, do you mix with your brush or do you mix with your palette knife? So far I'm mixing with my brush. Um, and the reason for that is because I'm gonna be using it. And I just wanna show you guys how it works. But if you're mixing a large amount of paint, it might work better for you to use your palette knife and to grab a chunk of paint at the same time. And then you kind of use it like a trowel and press the paint together. I tend to mix more paint than I need. Um, you won't want to do that at first, and I'm hoping to break you of that. Most students say, are like, well, paint's expensive. I only want to use what I need to use. The downside there is that you wind up being very frugal with your paint, and you wind up kind of half-assing your painting a lot because you're like, don't want to use the amount of paint that it needs to cover the canvas. Um, and uh, one of my professors in undergrad, a guy named George Hughes at the University of Oklahoma, he told me, uh, very often, he's from Ghana, and he had a Ghanaian accent. He would say, Grant must never be frugal with paint. And he was right, you know, anytime you're frugal with paint, you kind of make this these bullshit decisions. They kind of suck, you know? And so you have to kind of, you know, what you want to do is use enough paint that you can get enough done uh, to make moves and that you're not constantly remixing the previous color again. Now, what you can see is that now that I've shifted to a palette knife, I'm making significantly more paint uh, in each one and palette knives are great for that. They also keep your brush clean while you're working and give you a chance to just kind of keep working it in. Okay, so what I'm trying to get here are just a few different steps. I'm gonna step it towards black, get a little bit darker one and kind of let you see just how to, how to mix. And I recommend that this is how you start when you start working on your still life at home is that the first thing that you should do is basically just start mixing and feel what the paint feels like. Um, one of the, I've never really found a very good like how to paint book. Um, they, they might have really good images in them and they might have some cool ideas for assignments and things like that. But one of the problems is that they often can't really accurately describe what it feels like or smells like. Um, it's kind of like cookbooks in that way. Paint, you kind of like, you can feel it when it's got the right viscosity under your brush and when it's got the right level of kind of fluidity and, and flows more smoothly. And so that's what I recommend you do. Get used to the feel of it. So what I'm doing is I'm just mixing kind of a grayscale. And if we were in class, I would actually have you do that. I would have you mix a nine step or seven step grayscale from pure black to pure white in equal steps. And that can function like a ruler for you when you look up at the at the still life that you're working from. You can say like, where on my scale is that highlight on the ball? Where on my scale is that little light space next to the shadow? That sort of thing. So mix a little grayscale. Once you get some that you're happy with, then I want you to try a move that's very important to get down, to get good at. Um, and that's a blend. And you can just do it right on your palette. Um, so I'm just gonna get a little bit of fluidity. I'm gonna grab a little bit of this light over here on the side and I'm gonna lay it down. And then I'm gonna grow, oh, this is really good advice. I like to paint with two brushes active, at least two. The reason for that is because I have a, then I get to have a light brush and a dark brush. And so if I'm on the darker side of the scale, I'll use my dark brush, lighter side of the scale, light brush. It keeps me from ever having to like take a brush that's been dipped in, dipped in black and try and convert it to white, which is a huge pain in the ass. And like you wind up wasting a lot of paint. So light brush, dark brush. So with my light brush, I'm kind of starting a little bit lighter and I'm blending into that slightly more medium gray. With my dark brush, I'm gonna grab a couple little areas and kind of blend back the other direction. Hopefully this will show up on camera okay. Yeah, not bad, all right. 
Now I'm gonna, still with my dark brush, grabbing a little bit darker, and I'm gonna kinda see where we're at as I work that across. So, why do I want you to practice a blend? Basically, I mean, honestly, as a painter, the blend is like one of the sexiest moves you've got, and you should practice it. Uh, it takes a little bit of getting used to, um, but you can, once you have the startings of a blend, you can then um, control it a little bit better by cleaning off some of the excess off of your brush. Uh, if I'm trying to save that paint, I can take my palette knife and just kind of scrape it along the brush a little bit. You want to be careful not to damage your brush, though. Your brushes um, that you get obviously will last better the longer, the better you treat them. Once you get it a little clean, wipe it on my rag, get some of the excess off. And then I'm going to take a little dip of solvent and rush it back across the blend. And pretty slick move. And this can be, you can take a lot of time with your blends and you can get it to almost be like a digital blend, like from, from a pure space, like a pure white to a pure black with no variation inside that. And if you get that space, you have a lot of room to make your uh, decisions as you work really well. So, um, okay, let me see if there's a few other things that I wanted to talk about before I move on. Um, to the still life and I'm gonna paint for a little while. Uh, we've been live for you know about 30 minutes, uh, 20 minutes so far. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and keep working for about another 30 and get started on this painting. Um, that'll be hopefully a way for you to kind of follow along uh, with your still life at home. Um, I sometimes use different mediums with my oil paint. One of my favorites is this one right here. This is called Galkid Light, um, and it is uh, also made by Gamblin. I'm kind of a Gamblin guy. And uh, this speeds drying time and increases um, uh, like a little bit of the gloss in the paint, and it's a, it's a pretty good su uh, substance. I won't talk about mediums a ton in painting one um, because, frankly, I think it's hard enough starting to manage all the paint stuff that goes on, but I know a fair amount about mediums. So if you have any questions, you want to talk to me about mediums or anything like that, by all means, just throw, throw those questions my way and we'll share them with your classmates as we kind of have that discussion. Um, you'll notice that in your syllabus, I asked you to buy a number of paints um, and I divided them between week one and week three. And that's because I know that uh, many of you are in um, like, you know, have a job, have a problem with COVID, money might be super tight. And I'm aware that your painting supplies for this class are a high cost. And I'm sorry for that. Art supplies are expensive. Um, and on the bright side, you actually do get what you pay for. Um, there's, no, there's no textbook for this class. So I'm not having you buy like a $100 textbook that you'll only use for one term and then sell back for $30 or something like that. Instead, you're gonna spend probably 150 bucks on paint and brushes and you know solvent and, and jars and all that kind of stuff and it's going to be yours forever and hopefully this is just the first step towards your painting uh journey and all the stuff that you keep will be yours and and you'll be able to use it again if you take painting two with me in the spring or if you take a comic book class in the spring or 2d design or what have you you'll have some stuff that you can use in those other classes build yourself like a good little uh kit so i want to really quickly talk about the paints that i'll have you buy Really important ones that are coming up soon are these two browns. This is a burnt sienna, uh, is the kind of lighter red one, and burnt umber is the darker browner one. And these are great and really good for underpainting. That's what we're gonna use them for in week three. Um, we also have um, ultramarine blue, which is just a classic blue, uh, classic blue, ultramarine blue. Um, and then uh, the, the yellow and the red we've already talked about. Additionally, uh, we have, Lazarin Crimson, a uh, really beautiful, cool red, very dark, um, and a uh, phthalo green, a very warm green. And these two mix together to make a really beautiful black. And I'll talk about that as well in week three after we're kind of talking about um, underpainting and so on. Uh, yellow ochre is uh, a great one. Uh, this is one that you can actually mix if you don't want to buy a whole tube of it. You can mix it by just taking whatever your regular yellow is, either Hansa or cadmium, and mixing a little violet into a purple, and that will work. Um, 
uh, uh, Zoe or Zoe, not sure, Zoe the bro, uh, says, how long does the paint take to dry? Uh, well, that really depends on a number of things. Um, obviously, I, I assume you mean oil. Uh, if it's acrylic that you're asking about, then um, acrylic will dry within 15 minutes, 20 minutes tops. Um, and if it's a warm space uh, with a lot of airflow that you're working in, it can even dry faster, much faster than that. So with acrylic, you're always kind of working in layers. You're thinking about what can I get done right now? And then what do I have to add on top of it to get it to where I want it to be? Because you're not gonna start and finish a painting without it drying. In the case of oil, typically speaking, you have one day of open time, no matter the thickness that you're painting with, okay? That means open time means the painting is still wet enough for you to go in and manipulate it. Um, but some pigments, like a lazarin crimson, for instance, are very slow to dry. It depends on how thick you put them on um, and if you've done anything else, added anything to them. Uh, quick example from me from my painting one class where I screwed up. I made this big painting, like a three foot by four foot painting. It was a nude figure. I did the nude figure all in gray. And then I, the background, I coated in like a quarter inch thick skin of a lazarin crimson. And that shit did not dry for like seven months. It was like all over all the seniors in my class's paintings because it was sitting in the rack and it was just like sopping wet, like red. It looks like lipstick basically. And it's like, it got on everything and it was a total screw up. So like, don't put a inch thick skin of a Lazarin Crimson and you'll be in better shape. Most paints don't take six months to dry. Most of them will take a day or two to get tacky to the touch and you'll be able to work back on top of them. And we'll talk a little bit about some methods that you can use for speeding that up. Uh, many of my friends who are oil painters who paint in, in what's called in plain air, which means uh, you're actually in the space that you're painting, like you're out in the landscape and you're painting the landscape right then live. Um, they will scrape down their painting as they're working. So if they do something and they don't like it, they'll take their palette knife or a piece of cardboard and like scrape the surface so that there's less paint on there and it'll dry faster and they can keep working back on top of it. Um, I know that doesn't quite answer your question perfectly, but that's because really the answer is it depends. Get to know your paints. Um, some of the more notoriously slow drying colors are black and white, um, a lazarin crimson. Uh, some of the faster drying ones are burnt sienna, burnt umber, ultramarine blue. Uh, so uh, they'll dry within a day or two. Um, okay, hope that helps. Let's talk a little bit about this still life behind me. I'm gonna switch screens uh, for you real quick. Okay, so um, behind me you can see if I move out of the way, what I'm gonna be looking at, and I have an image of it that I'll pull up that you'll be able to see. Now my uh, palette's a lot smaller, you should be able to watch me kind of start to get along. I recognize that this isn't ideal. You know, I'm gonna be sitting here like this and you're gonna be kind of blocked from view of like what I'm actually working on. Um, so in the future, I, when I'm not trying to show you my palette all the time, I'll probably have my camera pointed directly at, this, at the surface if I'm expecting you to watch me paint. And that will be like, hopefully a little easier to see. But for this first one, I hope this will work out okay. So my still life that I set up is essentially what I'm hoping you guys make something that you're excited about at home. Um, so what I did, and you can see in the image down below, is I have some really simple shapes. Uh, I was kind of joking earlier, these are kind of like the shapes that only happen in art school, <laughs> right? Like a perfect white cube, um, kind of a, conal, a conical shape, um, a couple gray and black blocks, a really shiny cup, and that's a bobcat skull in the middle. Um, and you can see that I just put it on a, on a small table. I draped it with a gray cloth and then I draped a black sheet behind it. Um, and that helps a lot in just kind of gathering a little space, kind of like a stage that I can look at and figure out as I, as I go. Um, the, otherwise, you're just looking at the white concrete of my studio wall uh, on the right-hand side of the image. And so what I wanna talk about as you get started is just giving you a few tips because I know it can be very intimidating when you've never really painted before and like you're like, how can I do this? How do I get started? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my lighter of my two brushes and I'm gonna grab a little bit of my medium gray on my palette and I'm gonna kind of make it pretty wet. I'm using a fair amount of solvent and it's going to be pretty easy to draw across this surface. And as I work, I'm just going to um, start kind of deciding what my composition should be. 
Now, composition is a word that you'll hear me say a whole lot. Um, it means the shape of the things that you put in your painting or drawing or photograph or sculpture. Um, and it's a really commonly used art term that will kind of spread across this whole surface. So the first thing that I'm thinking about is like, what do I care about painting in that? And I, for one, really like the bobcat skull. That's why I put it in there, right? So, and I like that reflection that's on the cup that's right next to it. So I know I want that to be fairly large. So I'm gonna, I don't know about smack in the middle. I think that might look kind of dumb. So I'm gonna kind of block in a few things. So I'm gonna think about maybe the cup goes like here and maybe the bobcat skull is gonna go kind of here. And you notice that I'm just going straight into it with paint. I'm not messing around with like drawing and pencil or charcoal or something and then painting over it. Um, but you are totally allowed to uh, if you paint, um, or I'm sorry, if you draw on your surface with pencil and you're trying to be really careful, you can spray it with a workable fixative uh, after you're done and after you're done with the drawing and that'll seal it in and then the graphite or charcoal won't get into your paint. But my only downside with that is sometimes I find that artists who draw it on first, almost it's like they get really careful, like they're painting inside the lines, like it's a coloring book. And I don't want to be careful as a painter. I want to be surprised as a painter. I want the paint to kind of talk to me as I work my way through it. And I want to kind of like figure out what the painting is trying to tell me while I work. So I like to dive right in with paint and I use my brush as like a drawing tool and I kind of start to think about shapes and nothing is really um, sacred at this stage. Anything that I screw up, I, I don't mind moving it around a bit. Like if I, if I get something that I'm not that crazy about, I will shift it around. And I'm just kind of trying to put some, some markers, uh, like some, some landmarks for myself as I work from one object to another. So I'm noticing that inside this kind of reflective surface, I got a line back from the gray thing and that gray block kind of goes about like that. And it's gonna go, man, right up almost to that corner. And then I've got probably a cool shadow that's gonna cast right there. And the phrase that I use for this is I call this working, not just me, I, I call it working general from the general to the specific, okay? And that's the way that I think about it. I want to just get things on there very generally, very broadly speaking, so that I kind of know what it is I'm looking at. And so also that if I decide I want to move something, I don't like it where I put it, it's no big deal. I spent a relatively small amount of time on it and then I can go on and make some other things happen. Um, now I'm using a medium gray for this kind of blocking in because I don't want to go too light or too dark yet. Um, I want to kind of save those extremes for once I start to figure out where, like what's happening in the rest of the painting. Um, one more note that I didn't mention earlier about my still life itself. I have a light, you can see uh, this up here. This is just a clip lamp. Um, I'll show you in a minute, uh, but it's just a, a cheapy clip lamp. They're like eight or nine bucks. You can get them at Fred Meyer or Home Depot, Lowe's, whatever. And uh, they're great to have in your studio space because they'll clip onto something and you put a light bulb in there and then you can control the light source uh, for your still life or, or for your, your setup so that you're not just stuck with whatever like individual bulb is, happens to be in the room that you're painting in. I think it's so freaking cool that you all are making art in this time that you've decided to like take some time for yourself and to study and to try and get better at a craft at something that you think is, is going to be worth like knowing how to do. It's really impressive. I I'm just, I'm super happy to have y'all in the class. And I think it's a, it's a good thing for us to be doing at this time. You know, the world kind of, you know, for lack of a better word sucks. Right. And I think it's important for us to be able to like do something that is, is good um, for us and for kind of improving, you know, if not the world, then at least our space inside of that. So, you know, make some stuff, teach yourself how to do some things, develop a discipline, um, start to learn how to mess with with different materials and see where it starts to get you. Okay, so at this stage, anytime I'm, I'm kind of getting to a point where I can see what I'm starting to do with the painting, I wanna take a quick step back and just make sure that I like what's happening. And if I don't, now's the time to kind of fix it. Um, it's okay, I don't know. To be honest, I kind of wish I hadn't put this so much smack in the middle. I kind of wish I had scooted it over. Um, 
And so I'm gonna do that. It's gonna be fast. I'm gonna take a rag, I'm gonna dip it in a little bit of solvent, okay? And I'm just gonna quickly wipe the surface. And it's gonna mess up my clean white uh, canvas, but I actually like that. I'm gonna dip it a little bit more in, a little bit more solvent, and I'm gonna wipe out where I want that skull to go. So I'm gonna scoot the skull over and down a little bit. right about there and just kind of clear off a couple things so you can see what I'm doing now I'm gonna work fast to get us back to where we just were One of the things I really like about oil painting is how you can just basically kind of erase it almost like it's charcoal. Um, if in your drawing one class, you got to work with charcoal very much in a subtractive method, then you should have been able to like learn how to kind of just wipe through things and practice working that way a little bit. And it's, it's very similar in oil paint. You can just kind of smear it and that gives you a lot of fluidity. Like you kind of work in this way that gives you room to kind of move things around. And, and I really like that um, about painting in oil, painting in general, but especially painting in oil. All right. Thanks for your patience. Try and get some more work done pretty fast here. So when I'm blocking in some of these value shapes back, dealing with the shape or size of something, go ahead and take a second and do a little drawing one measuring with it. And uh, I'll post, there's a lot of good videos on how to measure, um, and I'll, I'll find one and post it uh, if you guys want, uh, that'll help you out. But that's, that's really kind of a, a drawing one thing, so I'm not gonna go over it right this second. But it's okay if you don't know how to do it. Um, you can learn it really fast. Yeah, I already like this composition more. See, because now the box gets to move over a little bit more, and this thing that was like jutting off the edge, I'm gonna have some room for it now. I didn't, I didn't quite like the way it was, you know, kind of taking my eye off the side of the surface over there. So now I'm gonna have a little bit more control over that shape, which I'm gonna make way too dark for a second. So when I'm like trying to cover some big sections of the painting, I like to make it kind of messy, as you can tell. Like this probably doesn't look like much to you yet, and that's okay. Like I'm gonna start to go into a little bit more detail as I go on. You know, I'm gonna take my rag and I'm gonna brighten up some areas so that I don't get too much kind of mucked into place. I'm gonna kind of figure out where the other shapes go, like this black block down here, like how that kind of cuts into this space. Yeah, let's throw in a little bit more. All right, much happier with where this is going. Um, I will post uh, for you guys to look at uh, this week or next. You can see it on the week, I think it's on the week one module. Um, there's a really great video by a guy named Mark Carter who has a uh, wonderful uh, YouTube channel that I highly recommend that you watch um, and give him some likes. Uh, he's a great uh, still life painter and he does some cool, he has some cool like things that he uses um, that are kind of his own invention and his own kind of methods for working inside that space and very, very neat. Try not to get too intimidated by something like a reflection. Uh, reflections, just, just still consider them shapes, shapes of value uh, and just look inside the reflection, find what you're looking at and kind of simplify it down into a shape that's like 
more like a okay that's not a reflection of a skull it's just a reflection of, of like a kind of ball or something like that and it'll make your life a lot easier so one of the things that you're going to have to be practice on this still life particularly is distinctions in shades of gray distinctions in value and it's one of the reasons why i like to start you off with a relatively simple still life like this is because it gives you a chance to really kind of start to practice determining if something is too light or too dark based on what you're doing okay let's see uh iliana says uh you're going in with a medium kind of shade so you can add in darks and lights my name is yeah um Yes, absolutely. That's right. And so I'm kind of creating like a gray wash so that I can push darks in and pull out lights, kind of work both sides of that at the same time. Thanks for the question. And once I kind of start getting some of my broader tones in, I'll start giving a little bit of detail to some of the forms as well. I'm keeping everything pretty sloppy, honestly, right now, you know, like not great. It's not great, Bob. It's not what you want, but it is just getting kind of started and it's helping me to start to see what it is I'm actually looking at. And um, if you know someone who's a much better, who you think of as a much better drawer than you, oh man, you know. Emily, Emily's so much better than me. She's great. I wish I could draw like Emily. Well, there's a pretty good chance that Emily is a better drawer than you because she's seeing a little bit better than you. She's like actually looking at the shapes in a little bit more controlled way than you are. She's looking at things and understanding um, their relationships, size, position, value to one another. And she's doing something that you can learn, okay? It's not just some magical gift. Um, it's also practice and study and some technique that you need to learn, right? Like you, nobody just knows how to do this stuff. You have to learn it. And that's what you're here for. All right, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this skull, I think. Cause this is the reason I'm here, let's be honest. This Bobcat skull, by the way, I bought some years ago at a shop in Portland called Paxton Gate. I don't know if any of y'all have ever been there. Um, it's a great place, uh, really cool stuff, including a lot of skulls um, for reasonable prices. Um, some of them are expensive, but a uh, cool place. I think while I have this particular gray, I'm gonna lighten this up a little bit and just throw a quick wash on the tabletop underneath this guy. Use a lot of solvent. You'll see it drip a little bit. And that's just because I want to clear. I, I just want to kind of wipe away uh, kind of to, I'm sorry, what was your name again? Eliana. Eliana's question and to her point, to their point, um, I want the kind of surface, um, to the white to go away a little bit. Um, one of the things that often really harms students work, uh, in drawing one, for instance, they're working on this big white sheet of paper and they're working with a pencil and the white of the paper is just kicking their ass, man. It's like so bright, um, that everything they do is not gray enough and it's not dark enough. There's not enough contrast and the white of a canvas can do the same thing. So I like jump at the chance to start getting rid of some of that white, you know, to like push it further back so that I can pick and choose when I want to use white instead of just being stuck with it kind of everywhere, you know? So here we go. Getting better. This is all still something that I personally would consider very much underpainting, really, really loosey goosey and something that will uh, be kind of boring when it dries. It's not going to have a thick enough surface to like um, look really sexy. Like I was saying that oil paint will, because I'm not putting very much paint on here. You know, essentially, you know, my, my old teacher, George Hughes, he would say, Grant, you're being frugal with paint. And so I'm not gonna be, I'm gonna eventually really thicken it up. But while I'm here drawing, 
I kind which it's kind of really what I feel like this is right now is a drawing. I want to keep it pretty loose so that I can control what I'm doing a little bit better. You can see on my palette here in the small thing that I've got like kind of a puddle forming of solvent and that's okay. Uh, if you're using water, if you're in acrylic, that'll be the kind of same thing. Um, and that will also kind of help me, uh, that looseness, that kind of puddle and almost like working with water, like a watercolor keeps it really light for a second and able to kind of see where I'm going. And like my brush just kind of glides across the canvas, very easy to push and pull. I'm still using a kind of a big clunky brush as well, but I'm about to shift away from that uh, here in just a minute. So I kind of wipe my brush off because I want to grab some, some whiter white. And uh, that's because I want to finally handle a little bit of the planar se sections of this skull. When I say planar, I mean the planes and how they shape towards me. So I want to kind of make a distinction between this side of the skull, this kind of right side right here, and how that picks a little bit of the light from the um, lamp above it and all the way across the top of the orbital socket, orbital socket meaning the, the eyeball. And then as it shifts around to the other side, I'm seeing a pretty distinctive, although subtle, shift in value to a little bit darker than that light that I was just using. So I'm gonna kind of make a little bit grayer tone. I'm gonna pull that in across the top to make a distinction point between those planes so that I'm now thinking about it as like side of the skull, top of the skull, right? Like side of the skull, top of the skull. And then that lets me kind of make some decisions both in terms of value and brush stroke that will help me to kind of spot that in. And again, I'm not being, I'm not being very tight with this yet. And I'll grab that far side of the skull, which is significantly darker. For this, I'm using a much smaller brush, a round. The round is what I'll do more of my um, kind of more controlled painting with in a little bit. But for right now, I'm still being pretty clunky with it. Really just kind of defining the side of the painting there. Now I'm gonna, I still have a lot of light on my brush and I'm gonna kind of use that to get this like little glow happening around that form. I'm sure this doesn't look like anything yet. <laughs> So if I'm doing this right, what should be starting to happen is that I should start to be having like a little bit more solid form with that skull, something that looks a little bit more like an actual shape sitting on a table and a little less like something that's kind of emerging out of a foggy cloud. And that will give me a lot of control when I wanna start putting in detail because I'm, this, this work that I'm doing right now is mostly about creating dimensionality, right? And says, uh, well, we need to use gesso on any of our canvases, canvases from Kyle. 
Um, no, Kyle, uh, you don't have to. The, the canvases that uh, you picked up from Clark are already gessoed white. Um, it's a good question, by the way. Gesso, G-E-S-S-O, is a um, uh, something else I should talk about briefly. It's a primer and a ground. Um, so the primer means that it serves as like a white. They also make gray and black gesso uh, for you to paint on top of. But the, the, the fact that it's a ground, it's also like a glue size. So it actually seals the canvas from air. And that can make your paint a lot more um, archival. It'll last longer, um, which is good. But uh, most of the store-bought canvases, if you see them and they're already white, they've already got one factory installed coat of gesso on there. So you can coat them more, well, you can put more layers of gesso on if you want, like if you're planning on making like a thicker surface that you wanna sand down or something like that, but you don't have to. Uh, now, if you buy raw canvas, like, and you stretch it yourself, um, then you, you have to put a coat of gesso. And I would actually recommend two coats before you start painting. One coat to kind of force it into the surface of the canvas and then another coat to actually kind of smooth everything out. Uh, but if you're working from the store-bought canvases, you can just dive right in, that's what I'm doing. Now, in my own personal choices with my paintings that I make in my more professional practice, I do use multiple coats of gesso. I work um, on kind of a slicker surface and the gesso helps me build that up. So when I go with my brush back to the palette, I'm picking up the value, the, the, the tone of gray that I want, but I'm also um, like pushing paint from the back of my brush out to the tip and then kind of picking it up with the brush. And that helps me control it a lot better um, so that it's not all at the back, at the ferrule of the brush. And now you'll sometimes need to wipe off your, your uh, brushes as well as I drop them all over the place. You also sometimes need to wipe off your brushes because they're going to like start to pile up a little bit of like solvent at the base, the ferrule, the back spot right there. So I feel like right now what I'm still doing is kind of making notation for myself for future decisions like kind of trying to get my value choices right, deciding where to put a little bit of emphasis into light and shadow, that cast shadow around the skull. is gonna be really important later in the painting. And I wanna just kind of be sure to think about all that now as I'm laying things in. And so that's, you know, I think this is a little too dark, this, this shadow that I'm putting in there right now. So I'm actually gonna lighten it up a touch, but I am gonna to start to work with it a little bit more. And let's get a lighter tone around that too. Lighten this ground a little bit. So you can see that in real life, I'm not looking at the photo that I, that I provi provided for you guys on the screen. I'm looking at what's actually in front of me. And I really recommend that. The, the temptation is to look at the photo. And the photo can certainly help you, um, especially figure out if you, and I have no problem with that. There's nothing wrong with painting from a photo. Many of us do a lot. Uh, I sometimes am an illustrator by trade and, and then I use photo reference all the time, you know? So don't be afraid to do it. But on the other hand, I don't want it to be your crutch. I don't want you to have to feel like you have to have a photo in order to figure it out. So you wanna start working um, from observation as much as possible. And because you're gonna see a lot more detail that way than even what the camera will show you. And I want you to be able to kind of spot that for yourself and it will take some practice. So figuring out how to make the jump from three dimensions to two dimensions is one that you're gonna need to basically practice on. Okay, I'm gonna scoot back, take a look. This is important to do from time to time as you're working, just make sure things are kind of um, shaping up the way that you want them to. And yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy with this so far. You know, it doesn't really look like a skull. It kind of just looks like a boxy, cat head, I guess, but it's going, it's, it's giving me, things are in the right place. You know, I'm starting to be able to see where my values need to go and I can get in there and do a lot of rendering and the kind of, you know, detailed work whenever I want. It could be today or I could let it sit for a day and then come in and work on it tomorrow and still get some things done. And this is kind of how I think you're going to likely have to work in this class is like kind of thinking about your 
your day and what your, um, what your day is like, how much time you have to paint. If you only have a couple of hours to paint, come in and block things in, get things in the right position, and then try and give yourself enough notations and notes for yourself that you'll know where to go next. And then come back in when you have a little bit more time and dive back into it. The real way to get good at painting and drawing is to try and do it basically every day if you can, even if it's for a short period of time, at least five days a week. Definitely don't just try and set aside like one day a week, like Sunday is my day and I'm gonna work 15 hours on Sunday. Um, you can get a ton done in a 15 hour Sunday, but it's, it, it's harder to learn that way. Um, many of you in your posts said that you play sports, um, in your introductory uh, posts say that you play sports or that you're a musician or like to dance or something. It's very similar to all those other crafts, all those other skills. Just doing it day in and day out is one of the ways that you're gonna get a lot better at the control of it so that it doesn't feel like you have to have this like perfect day to time everything up for you to get enough painting done to make a difference. Like just, even if you're only doing it for 20 minutes, sit down for 20 minutes and, and work a little bit. And you'll see a lot of um, the intimidation that, that comes with starting to paint will go away when you realize there's nothing magical about this, man. You're just, you're just pushing goop around and you can get better at it and, um, and it's, you can learn it. So the, the myth of the like genius artist that was like gifted by God with the ability to make a painting, it's horseshit, man. You can learn it, you can teach it, you can practice it, and you can do it too. Okay, I think I'm about done with this skull for a minute. I'll pop in and around of some of the other shapes on the canvas, and then I'll probably wrap this up here pretty soon. I've been going for about an hour um, on this uh, um, live stream. Please throw any uh, more questions that you might have into the chat before we get out of here. I will eventually keep working on this uh, still life, and I'll post some more images for you guys uh, as it starts to shape up. Um, but there's no reason for you all to just necessarily sit here and watch me paint. Um, as fun as I find it, you might have other things you need to get started on. I am excited about that shiny ball though, that shiny cup, that's gonna be cool. Um, so you can actually see from my perspective, that like much closer to that surface than you are, like I can see the table arcing away. I can actually see my own arm in the cup too. Like there's gonna be like a little self portrait of me, like right there, which will be kind of cool. And then uh, the skull itself is like shaped in there too. That'll be neat. So I'll kind of block that in. Don't be intimidated by transparency or reflection, just treat them like anything else. It's just a shape, it's just a shape. If you can figure out the shape and you can make your hand do it, use a little value ruler and decide what, where on my value scale those tones are and then block it in and there's no reason you can't start to figure out how to make that happen. What I recommend as you're setting up your own still life this week is pick at least one object that you think is awesome. You know, pick at least one thing that you're really excited to paint. For me, it was that bobcat skull. Um, but also pick a couple easy shapes, a couple shapes that'll help you kind of block in some space and give yourself a more interesting and complicated composition. And then, uh, and it'll give you something else to practice on. So even if you have like, you know, boxes are really good. Um, eggs are really good um, for like little round things that you have. Books are awesome, especially if you have black or white books because you might have those just laying around. You can set those up in there. Okay, we have a few more questions coming in. Uh, Zoe says again, how does gouache compare to oils? I normally use gouache. Gouache is closer to watercolor or acrylic. Um, it stays active and live, but in gouache case, usually you're working on paper as the ground. That's a really big distinction because it means that you're typically keeping the white of the ground as a primary force in your whole gouache painting. So in canvas painting, a lot of times you're eliminating big chunks of the white as you work, like I'm doing right now. So um, gouache is a dry kind of silky substance once it dry, like once it's done. 
and um, I love it. It's a beautiful surface. I love gouache so much. But um, it's uh, if you've never worked with it before, it's, think of it kind of like an opaque watercolor. Um, it's like uh, it's also act live as soon as you get it wet again. So it's it's cool. I recommend you guys get yourselves a gouache set if you like to do watercolor in your drawings or your sketchbooks, and um, and work with it. By the way, if you don't have a sketchbook, get yourself a sketchbook. Um, start drawing in it, drawing and painting, uh, working digitally. If you, if you work in an iPad or in Procreate or something, all the same game, man. Like any, any way that you want to play it, uh, just be practicing, be constantly like thinking about like how to make interesting compositions, practice how to draw stuff, challenge yourself to try things that you've never tried before that you think you might not be able to do and give it a shot. Um, you'd be surprised how much fun you can have tackling a subject matter that seems like way too hard for you, you know? Um, let's see. Uh, Daniel says, um, I looked at the assignment. I want to be sure on the 27th, we'll be turning in what work we have uh, done so far to be critiqued. Yes. And I say, uh, yeah. So basically, Daniel, what um, what is due this week on Sunday is whatever you've gotten done on this painting. Okay. Your in progress view of it. So it's not due yet. Uh, post that to the in progress critique page so we can see where everybody's at. I'll tell you what, I'll do the same. I'll take a photo of this and post it on there wherever I'm at on Sunday. And we'll just go around and I just want you to um, give each other some feedback. Uh, tell us what you think about the work. How do you think it could be better? Um, it's okay to say, hey man, this is awesome. That's great. Like we all love praise. Um, but we're, we're not, I'm not your mom and you're not my mom. So praise isn't the goal here. Help me make, help me get it better. What do you think needs to be darker? What do you think needs to be lighter? Does something look a little off in perspective? Um, is there something that you think I should even repaint, which can be a really tough thing to hear, but is sometimes exactly what I need to hear. You know, if you're like, hey, everything looks great except that floating box back there. There's just something off about it. Take a look at it again, see how it goes. And you as an artist, it's your job to learn to take criticism well. And that doesn't just mean that you it doesn't make you mad. It also means that um, you need to be able to hear what is useful and let go of what isn't useful. So if someone says, let's say you always use red, use red in every painting. And on this one painting, you're like, no more red, sick of red. And then in the critique, it's like, you know, hey, you should you should use more red. Well, that's one that you can kind of let go of, right? You don't need to do that. You decided not to do that specifically. Okay. Uh, let's see. Jessica says, do you have any recommendations for brands of brushes? Um, cheap. You know, cheap but okay. Like the, the go to an art supply store, go to Blick, something like that, and buy yourself a little set that has like flats and rounds inside of it. And uh, that'll probably be okay. Maybe pick up one or two other ones. These are my favorite brushes, these black handled Utrecht brushes. And they're like, a little spendy, like maybe seven bucks each, six or seven bucks each, but not too bad. I have one really nice brush that's like 50 bucks and I do not use it. <laughs> it's like too, like I'm so scared to use it that I'm afraid that I'm gonna like break it or something. So I don't use it. So just get some brushes that you can afford. What I look for, if you're getting nylon brushes, um, which is what all of these are, this one's a bristle brush. I should have said this earlier. I'll put this in the, in the tags. Bristle brush is a lot coarser. It's for good for moving around heavy paint. The nylon bristles are closer to what sable bristles used to be, and they're for detailed work. And I really like the sable bristles that have, or, or um, nylon bristles that have a little bit of spring to them. So let me hold that up. So these are nice because they're really soft, but they also have a nice firmness to them. See how quickly that kind of bounces back up? And so that's why I like these a lot. Uh, if you use like really soft brushes like that you would use for watercolor, they almost feel like, like a makeup brush. Like those will have a hard time pushing around acrylic and oil. So you want a little bit stiffer than that. Um, but honestly, you don't need to spend a ton of money on brushes. I'd spend 10 or 15 bucks on brushes, get a variety of sizes, get one that's at least kind of a big like honker that you can push around a lot of paint with. Um, get yourself like a cheapy you know, gesso brush or, or like, I sometimes just use crappy chip brushes. Look how long I've been using this, using this one. It's like wrapped in duct tape. Okay, so like, these are good for getting big stuff in there. So you don't need to spend a lot of money on brushes. Um, uh, it's, just get what you need to get to get started, okay? Um, okay, let me see. I'm gonna throw in a couple things and I think I'm gonna wrap this up for today. So uh, are there any other questions for me before we get out of here? 
Um, I will post this video, of course, to my YouTube page and a link to it back to our Canvas page. And I will put um, kind of timestamps inside of it that will help uh, to navigate it again if you want to watch something else. Um, thank you guys so much for joining me. Um, again, my name is Grant Hoddle. I'm your professor for Painting One. Um, I'm really, really excited that you're here. Thank you so much. And uh, I can't wait to see what you guys make this week. So get started, make a little setup, get out your black and white paints, figure out how you're going to work. And um, when you post uh, by this Sunday in the In Progress Critique page, Go ahead and say what medium you're using. Are you using acrylic or oil or mixed media? Um, so, uh, okay. Thanks very much. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.